Hi, I'm Rebecca Valcarcel. Let's talk about Emily Dickinson's poem, Success is Counted Sweetest. Now keep in mind, she didn't put these titles on the poems. These are just the first lines of the poem, so we just use the first line as the title. All right, it's 12 lines, and it's pretty straightforward, but it does have some vocabulary that I can help clarify. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Now that's the first four lines, so let's just stop. She's claiming here that success is appreciated, counted sweetest, by those who never succeed. Ne'er is just missing the V. Never is what, it, what she means. So by people who don't succeed, uh, success is appreciated more and felt to be sweet. And then she mentions something that's very sweet, nectar, to comprehend a nectar. In order to understand the sweetness of the nectar, to really taste the nectar, you have to be needful. You have, you, it requires the most aching lack, the, the need for the success. That's what makes success sweet. And keep in mind, nectar is what's in a flower that a honeybee will turn into honey. So the nectar is the sweetest part of the flower, the liquidy, you know, deliciousness that a bee will turn into honey, which is very sweet. So nectar makes a good metaphor. She compares success and the sweetness of success to the sweetness of nectar. And if you're going to understand the nectar, you've got to need this victory, this success, this outcome. But if you actually achieve the success she is claiming, then you don't actually understand that success and the sweetness of the nectar as well as you could. Because once you've achieved it, it already starts to become normal to you. So once you achieve a goal, it's less shiny. You know, it's, it's more amazing from a distance. When it's just out of reach, that agony of getting close is the sweetness of it. And once you actually achieve it, according to Dickinson here, she's saying you can't understand the sweetness anymore. You're, you've already got it. And so it immediately starts to lose the sweetness. Uh, now, she's not saying that we can't enjoy our success, but she's saying that the person who just loses out, the person who fails, comprehends it even better than the successful person. Now she goes on to say, uh, or compare this, I guess elaborate these first four lines, this claim she made. She says, not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated dying on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. Okay, so quite a bit of vocabulary that might be tricky here, so let's look. Not one of all the purple host, the purple host are soldiers. She's living during the Civil War, and so she's talking about soldiers. Uh, she capitalizes host. Host really means a large group of people. Um, and host has other meanings, but here she means a whole host. Um, in the Protestant, well, in the Christian world, they talk about hosts of angels. And then she is from a, a very religious family, Protestant family. Um, although she's a bit of a rebel in her own spirituality, but she's using host the same way that, that she would have heard it used in the Bible or in hymns. Um, so the host is the whole group of people. So there's not one, she says, of all the purple group of soldiers who took the flag today, who went to the battlefield today with the flag, uh, can, who can tell the definition of victory. So the people who won have their definition of what victory is, but she says nobody in that victorious group will understand victory as well as he defeated dying the defeated soldier, the one who's dying, on whose forbidden ear, so on his ear, um, he's going to hear 
the victory songs of the other side, uh, the distant strains of triumph. So the songs of triumph, perhaps actual songs on instruments, perhaps singing, perhaps just cheers or cries of triumph, of victory, of winning. That's what the dying defeated soldier is hearing as he's dying. And she says that those strains, those melodies, burst on his ear, agonized and clear. So he's the one in agony. He's the one hurting right now. And because he's hurting, and because he's defeated, dying, he's the one that understands how sweet the victory is for the other side. So the loser understands victory and success better than the winner. So that's her poem. That's her, her idea. Um, another thing to mention about the poem, some technical things, uh, the rhyme. So we have uh, success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar required sorest need. Sorest means, you know, a, a deep need, a aching need. So need, succeed, those rhyme. And then in the next four lines you have today and victory, which don't exactly rhyme, but that's Dickinson. She takes uh, liberties with precise rhyming. And so for her, today, victory <laughs> is close enough. It ends with Y. And then we have ear and clear, which is a more traditional rhyme. She also uses rhythm very typically. She writes these short lines, seven or eight syllables, and then often six lines six syllables after that. So success is counted sweetest, seven syllables, by those who ne'er succeed, six. So seven, six, and the next line also seven, and then six. So we have a pattern there. Not one of all the purple host, so that's eight syllables, who took the flag today, so six. So that stanza is going to go eight, six, eight, six. And then the last one, as he defeated dying, we're back to seven, and then six, seven, six. So she's very particular about how many syllables go on each line. She packs a lot of imagery and insight into human nature, into the little, these little poems, short poems. She's not known for big, long, rambling sentences and lines that go to the edge of the paper. She's known for very small uh, compact poems that pack a punch and really surprise you with their insight. So that's Emily Dickinson and that success is counted sweetest. Join me for another Emily Dickinson poem soon.